after the introduction. Huh? Okay, so so hi everybody. Um, welcome to today's uh, colloquium by Yuen Tang. So it's 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 really a great pleasure to introduce Yuen. Um, Yuen, um, um, you know, was I believe something like a as something of a child prodigy. Uh, she skipped a few grades in in grade school and. Uh, and entered uh, UT Austin at the at the ripe old age of fourteen, and uh, uh, and as an undergrad did, did some of this work that uh, um, you know the, on on quantum machine learning that uh, um, you know that showed that um, that the work of Karenidis and Prakash on quantum recommendation systems could be done. Could be much of it could be duplicated classically, so um, really looking forward to your talk, Yun. Um, uh, following the talk, there'll be a panel, uh, so uh, at at noon. So uh, okay, take it away. Okay. okay, yeah, thanks for the very kind introduction. Um, yeah, so I am going to be talking about um, basically what what I what I feel like some of the the state is for the sort of the stuff that I work on. Um, which is um, quantum linear algebra for machine learning. Um, feel a little scattered right now, so feel free. I mean, as always, feel free to ask questions if you're if you're confused, and I uh, will try not to get get lost in my thoughts. Um, okay, so so um, I think so. So I've I've looked at some of like the previous Simon's uh, colloquia, um, and I've noticed that. Um, they sort of focus like there, there's a there's a been a, uh, a few that like focus on more more, more practical quantum algorithms, um, and this is not going to be that. So, uh, sort of the motivating question is to analyze um, like what what's possible for a um, quantum computer that's sort of like best of all possible worlds, um, and whether like like what's the nature of the speed ups that you can get with such a such a quantum computer, and whether and in particular can it like do things that would be useful for machine learning. Um, now, obviously, we probably don't live in the best of all possible world. I mean, I don't know, maybe, um, maybe there's some uh, metaphysics or, or something that you could use to ascertain that. But um, uh, part of the motivation for this is, is simply that like the algorithms um, that sort of arise, uh, arise if, you, if you sort of allow yourself to assume more things are, are pretty interesting and, and actually uh, fairly elegant. Um, and, uh, I'll use this as an excuse to sort of gloss over, um, details with like quantum algorithms in, that are uh, hanging in the background. Um, but another aspect of, of, um, studying these kinds of al algorithms is that, uh, if you can show that things aren't, aren't possible, like for example, that, uh, machine learning algorithms don't, um, like in certain contexts, quantum computers can't speed up machine learning tasks. Then these, this will have broad implications because, um, uh, you know, you're assuming the best possible quantum computer. And uh, finally, um, like I guess there's like a monetary incentive to consider um, the best of all possible um, world because you know, um, it's sort of like it allows it it, it um, allows you to say like if you if you have a, uh, an algorithm that allows you to say something um, that that in theory could be used. In, in some world to do something, then that means that you can use it in your um to to in your uh, company as like advertising or something. So um, I kind of feel like it's it's like it's part of my job. Sometimes feels like a little bit of like a like a journalism like fa fact checker or something like this. But um, anyways, so I'm gonna start off with some um, with introducing uh, the quantum linear algebra, and I'm going to do this using this um really nice um, singular value transformation framework. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so th this like, um, will leave some details. Um, we'll, we'll assume slightly more um, about, about their input, but um, it'll be nicer for me because I don't have to uh, go into the weeds. Um, so the fundamental notion, uh, um, that we'll be working with in, in terms of this quantum linear algebra algorithms is that of the uh, block encoding. So uh, we say we have a uh, block encoding 
of our particular matrix A, if we can, uh, if we have some unitary matrix U that we can efficiently apply, so we can efficiently apply U and U inverse, and such that A sort of has, uh, U sort of has A kind of inside it, embedded inside of it. Um, and basically more formally, how you would say this is that um, this top left block corresponds to the block that you get from uh, having uh, sort of uh, uh, some set, like your, your some set of qubits being set to zero and then applying you and then post-selecting on the um, those qubits remaining at zero. Um, and this uh, alpha is sort of just a, some some scaling because if you notice that because u is unitary, um, we have to scale a down so that its um, spectral norm is at most one. And so that's what this alpha is doing. Um, but alpha actually behaves a little bit, um, it, it, it's a little bit more uh, interesting than that. Uh, it, it's more like some sort of like computable upper bound for the spectral norm. Um, so we'll see cases where, where this alpha comes into, comes into play and actually um, gives us a rough time later on. Um, and right, so, uh, so I'm not yet saying how we get this block encoding for a particular matrix, um, but something to note is that if we did have a block encoding of a matrix, then uh, we could use it to perform linear algebra on quantum states. So, um, so in this setting, I'm going to be considering encoding vectors into the magnitudes of a quantum state. So in, in sort of this way here, um, where, so, okay, so VI are the entries of, of V and uh, Euclid, this is the Euclidean norm to make um, it, it norm one. And in this setting, if you, if you, um, if we had a block encoding of A, then we could uh, sort of append a bunch of qubits, zero qubits, and apply U. And then what we would see if we tried to post-select on the, on the first eight qubits is we would see AV, the state corresponding to A times V, um, with, with some probability after like post-select. So this is, um, uh, you can sort of think about it in your head that this is how it works. Um, and Don't you want a lower bound on the probability rather than an upper bound? Um, right, you do. Um, just, I mean, like, uh, in general, right, A is not, uh, A, like, in this most general setting, I haven't specified anything about A, so AV could actually be, like, uh, zero. Um, but I, I'm saying, uh, like, the, the reason why I'm putting an upper bound is because I'm just saying that um, this, this is why this alpha uh, comes into play later on, because the complexity of um, these block encoding, like the complexity of the algorithms involving these block encodings will inherently rely, uh, have to um, pay some cost that's like alpha over the spectral norm squared. Um, so just like as an, as an observation. Um, okay, any other questions? Okay, so. Um, Another nice property of these block encodings is that you can sort of compose them. Uh, and so what I mean by this is that if we have a bunch of uh, matrices, these AIs are, are matrices and say they're all like consistent. So all of the like block encodings are the same size, like all the matrices are the same size. Um, if we have a block encoding of AI, then we have a block encoding of like a linear combination of the AIs. Um, and so here we're thinking of K as being like constant. Um, and we're also think we're thinking of these lambdas as being, um, I think they need to be real. Um, and, or I guess they don't, I mean like um, for, for, for these purposes, they're real. Um, and also if we have an encoding of, uh, if we have these block encodings, we can also get a block encoding of the product. And uh, finally, if we have a block encoding, we can get a block encoding, a uh, block encoding of A, we can get a block encoding of uh, a polynomial of A. 
So here we're thinking of P as a polynomial that takes minus one, one to uh, minus one, one. And notice that, uh, and you can sort of see that if uh, like P of one over alpha times A um, always remains like spectral norm below one. In fact, it doesn't, it's not even two. Um, so so this, this makes sense. Um, now you might ask like why we um, need this third one if we already have these first two, because we already have these like linear combination properties and, and product properties. Um, but the fact is that like this third one, uh, this third property is actually the only property that is ever used. Um, I mean, like uh, it, it's like the, the one that gives you all the power. Um, because the issue with trying to use these first two to give you um, polynomials of um, of uh, of matrices and your uh, like block encodings of polynomials and matrices is that you have to pay uh, factors um, sort of you have to pay factors um, corresponding to the sizes of the coefficients, which um, um, we don't want to we don't want to have to put bounds on. Um, but nevertheless, these are going to be interesting properties for us to look at moving forward. And uh, proving these uh, block encoding facts, I mean, the first two is relatively straightforward. Um, so if we wanted to encode the product, right? So we have a bunch of encodings of AI, which we call UI, which, which, which are these UIs. And we want a block encoding of the product A1 times A2 through AK. Then uh, what we do is we just take the block encoding to be the product um, of them. And if we can efficiently um, apply U1 through UK, then we can efficiently apply U. Um, and just because of the way that matrix block multiplication works, um, this is the desired block encoding. Um, and as for uh, linear combinations, this is a little bit uh, like, this requires a little bit of a little bit more, but it's, it's actually just fairly straightforward. Um, we just need to find some way to take a linear combination of unitaries. And so what we do is we just append some, um, append some register, and then we use a unitary that's able to sort of prepare the linear combination, the, the, the state corresponding to this, like um, the weights of this, of this linear combination. So I guess, I guess here we're assuming, um, we're assuming that the sum of the L, uh, the lambdas is, is one, um, but um, but that's just for notational purposes. Um, and so, so this is going to be our block encoding for you. Um, you can sort of see that <clears throat> if K is a uh, constant size, then we can always prepare this P. I mean, um, maybe it's not easy in practice, but <clears throat> I can just say that um, here and be totally and get away with it. Um, and doing this is, is, is reasonable if we can um, apply, like sort of if we can condition on things, um, right? And, and so here's the, here's the computation to, to verify that this is the right thing. Um, okay, are there any questions so far? Yeah, quick question. So I guess you're not assuming use of any amplitude amplification to uh, raise the probability of success? Um, I guess you could. Uh, is, I mean, isn't block isn't uh, amplitude ampli amplification can't can it be encoded in this framework? Uh, um, it would use the third of your uh, bullets, the mm -hmm. polynomial, right? But yes, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yes. Yeah. So, so what I said before about these probabilities, they can actually, you know, be improved by a quadratic factor. I'm using this amplitude ampl amplification. Um, yeah, for, for, yeah. Um, it, it, yeah, it, um, um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> the reason I was wondering is actually because I've been suspecting that um, the use of all of these uh, cascaded uh, signal processing steps would all um, collapse into a single um, set of coefficients. Maybe you have something like that in mind. Um, but anyway, let me be patient and hear your main point. So thank you. Um, 
wait, can you, can you explain, um, like collapse into a single set of coefficients is in like, um, in the end, it'll uh, all just be one polynomial. Yeah, that's right. In the end that it, it might turn into all one signal processing polynomial. Um, yes, I, I agree. Um, <clears throat> so I guess it's not clear to me how like inherent the sort of compositional nature of these block encodings is. I guess you could avoid it if you wanted to. Um, this will be helpful because the classical thing I'm going to describe also has these properties. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, right. Okay, one final thing to note about um, if, you, if you wanted to, to actually use this framework is that uh, this ability to apply low-degree low polynomials is po pretty powerful. Um, and it allows you to actually basically just, uh, um, just to uh, apply smooth functions to A. Um, and so what I mean, mean by that is uh, it's just some quick notation. So um, here's the standard definition of, of Lipschitz. So F is Lipschitz if basically its first derivative is bounded by L. Um, and I'm going to denote applying a function to a matrix to be applying the function to all of the eigenvalues of the matrix uh, if you're, um, if you, if we're, if the matrix I'm applying it to is, is Hermitian. Um, and uh, this is like a well-defined notion and it's also consistent with um, these sort of poly polynomials in the sense of like, if I took a polynomial, uh, an expression of a poly polynomial and then plugged in uh, A for X, the result that, that I would get is the same as if I, um, you know, uh, apply the polynomial to all of the eigenvalues. And you can just see this via the eigen decomposition. Um, yeah, so uh, this is basically what I mean by matrix functions. And um, there's like well-known results. I, I, um, I have one here if you, if you're, if you um, want to look at one um, that says like, if you have a Lipschitz function, then it can be well approximated by a low degree polynomial. Um, and so in fact, what you'll see in a lot of these uh, singular value transformation applications is that you don't actually want to compute a block encoding of a polynomial uh, of, of your input. You want some other kind of function. And what you'll do is you'll find a good approximating polynomial and then you'll apply that. And that'll be your, um, your proxy for for the function that you want. And, it, and it'll give you some error. Um, right, okay. So um, now we come to the question of how we actually create these block encodings. Um, so there's, it, it's, it's um, sort of the technique, so, so the ways we have of creating block encodings are pretty limited because block encodings are such like a, powerful, um, like a powerful notion. So we, so we have to have a, a lot of assumptions to, to actually instantiate one. Um, one such thing is, is, is a, a QRAM, quantum random access memory. And uh, this can mean various things depending on the context. But in, in this context, I'm talking about this uh, data structure here. Um, so I, I've given it as an example for like the two by four. Um, but basically it's just like a binary search tree. Um, and the assumption that, uh, we're making is that you can actually query this data structure. Um, and, uh, so this data structure supports like updates and, 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 and like, um, updates to entries and things like this. Um, so it works as like memory and also you can uh we assume you can query all of the nodes at a particular level in superposition and this will allow you to prepare states corresponding to for example rows of a or like a state corresponding to the flattened uh flattened version of a um 
And so if, if we if we assume this, then we'll it'll give us a, a block encoding that's like the Frobenius sum of A uh, in, in terms of like the scaling. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a um, related, uh, I, I don't know if it's related, but um, but if you can prepare a sort of purified density matrix uh, corresponding to a over the a over the trace of a, then you also have a block encoding. Um, so one way you could get this uh, purified density matrix is 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 if it was in QRAM. But um, um, and finally, if if uh, a is uh, sparse and the entries are both like efficiently computable and bounded, so like you are able to query and superposition for like which entries are sparse and which, what the values of those, um, uh, which entries are non-zero and which of the, like what the values of the, those non-zero values are, then you can get a block encoding. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, this block encoding means we, we have to pay some factor of like alpha over the spectral norm of A eventually. And I haven't proven this. This is actually like maybe not immediately obvious. Um, but but that one example that I did, um, in that one example that I did, you had to pay this factor. So I'm gonna um, use that as justification here. Um, and so notice that like in these two cases, you have. Uh, oh wait, so here I guess I guess here we're assuming that A is PSD. Um, but anyways, in these two cases, uh, we're paying factors that are like could be as large as say the dimension size. Um, and so, um, but uh, you can assume that A is like low rank or something um, to, to fix these issues, um, but they're, um, but it's like a serious limitation of, 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 of these two um, sort of methods of getting block encodings as far as uh, super polynomial speed ups for machine learning. Um, and okay. Uh, are there any questions? I can move on. Sorry. So, so Yun, you're saying that um, um, even above and beyond the issue of quantum random access memories, this these these factors would uh, even if you had a quantum random access memory, these factors would dash our hopes later. Is is that? Uh, um, it'll dash your dash the hopes of maybe like an exponential speed up. Yeah. Uh, um, for polynomial speed up, maybe maybe the jury's still out for a yeah. significantly large polynomial speed up. Um, but yes, I, I think like uh, there are certain ways to phrase what the behavior that's going on. This is a way I've chosen to phrase it. Like it's sort of like a low rank assumption. This is what this mm -hmm. is. Um, um, and and note that like if if um, in the sparse case, our block encoding, um, this S here is much smaller than like the Frobenius norm of A. Like the Frobenius norm of A here would scale like, um, um, would scale like square root of Sn, I guess. Um, and so this is actually performing much better or big N. Uh, even can I ask for the second point? Are you assuming that A is PSD, or or maybe you are normalizing with the trace of the A absolute value, or what is exactly for the for the sparsity assumption? No, no, for the second one. The right. second one, you are yeah, you're assuming PSD. Yeah. Forgot to forgot to put it in. Okay, you good. Sweet. Okay, so um, now we'll enter some of like these uh, barriers. Um, so uh, these are things to, I guess, always keep in mind if you want to try to uh, build quantum algorithms in this space. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the same lessons still hold. Even um, like, I guess uh, Scott wrote this. Um, I don't know how many years ago, but like a while ago. And it, a lot of the lessons, I think. Sorry? 2014, I think. 2014, so it's been like <laughs> six, seven years. Anyways, um, 
uh, and a lot of the lessons are still applicable. Um, uh, okay, so I haven't actually mentioned yet how you use these block encodings that we we've been talking about to to um, get applications for machine learning. And so the typical way that this is done is, is that um, you have some vectors in your, ma your matrices that you want to um, you want to look at. And somehow, some, somehow you, you manage to encode these matrices as block encodings, and you manage, manage to prepare these vectors as quantum states. Um, and then at that point, when you do that, um, you can use your framework to compute some expression of your input. And then um, you can measure your output state, and then hope, maybe hope to get some like estimator of a desired value. And the hope is that this whole time, you've never actually written down your matrix or your vectors. You've only, um, you've only implicitly represented it like a length n or like m by n matrix in the size of like log mn qubits or log n qubits. Um, and so you could hope that maybe if I, um, uh, maybe if I stay in this representation the whole time, then I can do what I need to do without actually writing anything down, and therefore I I have an exponential speed up um, for for this like linear algebra task. Um, now note that like I've written QSVT here, um, but uh, this this holds for like generally li quantum linear algebra and machine learning. Um, it just happens to be that like I mean the QSVT framework sort of encompasses um, a lot of the uh, these applications here. Uh, it sort of unifies everything. Okay, so um, just as one example, so this, uh, this is, I'm going to sort of give a version of um, Harrow, Cinnamon, Lloyd's um, matrix inversion algorithm. And so the idea here is that I have some, as I said, I have, I have, I have a matrix and a vector of interest, and I want to compute A inverse B. And if uh, as I mentioned, if A is sparse and say like we know that it's it's spectral norms bounded, um, this means that in particular we have a bound on all of the entries. Um, then we can have a block encoding. Um, I guess we're also assuming like efficiently computable and everything. And then we're also going to say like okay, let's say our B is in QRAM, so we can prepare copies of B. We could also assume that it was like sparse or something. Um, and then at that point we. Um, use our uh, quantum singular value transformation to get a block encoding of this polynomial P, which is just the thing that you need it to be to approximate the inverse function. So um, if you apply the inverse function to A, you get A inverse, or I guess um, like here, I, I don't necessarily, I'm leaving out some details for how you would get actually a pseudo inverse if, if you were dealing with a low rank matrix. Um, but in any case, um, you have some P that's able to approximate X inverse. Let's say uh, it's approximating it on, um, on the interval. Uh, I think that's right. So this is this is sort of the minimum singular value and the maximum singular value. And so we actually we are approximating it everywhere where a everywhere that a notices everywhere that a cares about. And we can actually do this uh, with a with a polynomial of like this degree. Um, I'm just going to assert that. And at that point, we can apply our new block encoding to our vector B, and then post select to get the desired uh, states. Um, and then after that, we can you know do something, measure some expectation uh, of a, like an observable, or or you know just measure in the computational basis, and maybe try to you know see if it's heavily concentrated on one one index or something. Okay. And, and so if you work this out, the complexity scales like what I've written here. 
Um, and uh, so I'm leaving out. So like, in, I'm not, uh, I'm not including like gate complexity here because I'm, I'm, I sort of haven't specified enough to include a gate complexity. Um, but the number of times that you uh, would need to apply um, your block encodings is, is, is this much. Um, and that's sort of like, uh, maybe up to like log factors, uh, log n factors is your, is your, um, gate complexity. Um, and so as we desire, there's no ends in here. So this, uh, gives you something that's, uh, runs in time logarithmic in, in the size of the input. Um, now. This should sort of uh, raise some alarm bells as to like the particular locations that are um, maybe unreasonable. Uh, one of these is um, how I just asserted that you could encode these matrices as block encodings. Uh, so, as uh, there, um, so this 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 is called like the input problem. Um, like roughly speaking. We aren't necessarily sure, like uh, like quantum computers, uh, like for for quantum computers in this world, not the best of all possible worlds. We're not exactly sure how you could actually um, build this QRAM, or even like or like encode um, our input data into um, methods that allow us to read them as block encoding. Um, so he, like, I took this text from a from a slide. I was going to like actually like screenshot it and, and put it in, but I feel like um, I got worried about getting sued or something. So um, here's just the text. Um, sorry, and can I ask a question. Sorry. Oh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Can I ask a question right for us? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not so familiar with quantum computing, so it might look uh, very simple, but so I presume the lower the alpha, the better. Is that generally correctly understood? Um, yes. Okay, um, and is there an absolute upper bound on alpha you can give for existence, not for actually finding it? Is, for instance, root n times the operator norm an upper bound, which always um, works for all matrices? So it'll depend on how your input is encoded, like um, how your input is given to you. Um, so it um, it literally is just um, so so. So, um, okay, like it's a little bit subtle because um, the way that you encode the matrix as a block encoding specifies what the alpha is. So I haven't gone into the details of how you would create these block encodings, but you sort of see if you work out um, like, um, it's it's maybe something that you should think of as more like um, the like in in these QRAM settings um, where we have this data structure. The data structure includes um, the Frobenius sum of A, and that's sort of how you start your process of, um, for example, building the quantum states that you need. Um, so uh, it's a little bit weird. The way that I've described it is not consistent with the way that like you would think about it if you were doing algorithms, um, because the way that I've described it um, makes alpha sort of like a proof, like uh, like the the quantum circuit for like uh, preparing this this uh, block encoding would be a proof that alpha like is an upper bound for the spectral norm or something like this. Um, I, I I feel like I'm being um, confusing, but uh, does, does, does what I say kind of make sense? You know, somebody answered my question already. So alpha equals the operator norm is always achievable, apparently, uh, at least in existence. I mean, um, if you are uh, if you are given some A, like just like as a matrix, and you're asked to find some block encoding for it, um, I'm not sure how you could do that. Um, with alpha being equal to the spectral norm, um, maybe maybe I'm not I'm not informed, <laughs> um, but you could certainly do like spectral. Uh, you could just certainly do like Frobenius norm. Um, that would that would uh, be possible. 
Um, so, oh, you, you can always achieve operator norm if, if, if you just uh, ask whether there exists a quantum circuit achieving this. There is always because just the only requirement is that the top left corner is inside the unitary matrix and, and the only requirement there is that it, it has to be, the top left corner has to have operator norm at most one. But there may not be an efficient circuit achieving such a block encoding. And if you also want an efficient circuit, then you might need to choose a higher alpha. Is that is that understandable? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, the uh, the 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 sort of alpha notion is a little bit strange because um, the way I've specified it, you can actually have you know like a uh, actually I don't know. Um, basically, you can you can always increase alpha by scaling your a down, um, but. Uh, uh, and I haven't really, like accounted for this, but um, in any case, I will continue. Uh, right, so I was talking about how uh, the the slide after this is, but what about QRAM? It's like that's what it says, and and so QRAM does actually solve this problem. Um, but something to note is that it actually does give like a a, a worse block encoding. Um, and and so so um, that's something to note compared to like a sparsity assumption, which is actually um, because it's sparse, you have a, a basically basically uh, your your alpha is better. Um, and the other thing that uh, sort of I alighted or swept under the rug um, in my uh, inversion example is that at, as at the output. Uh, once we have the output in some quantum state, what are we going to do with it? Um, and because these are like uh, these output states only are only like log n qubits, we can really only extract like log n bits of information at a time about about the output. And so uh, it means that these uh, algorithms are really only useful for like yes/no type questions. Uh, and because we're working in such like a high dimensional space, you know, size large, size big n, you know, exponentially large, it's sort of a uh, not exactly clear like um, how like you could exploit this um, in a context where your problem is just like a yes or no thing. Um, I mean, you can do it, but um, it's something to keep in mind. OK, and there's finally one problem that I've been sort of leading up to, <clears throat> which is uh, stuff work, work that I did and that I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the rest of the talk. Um, and that's basically like, so you can sort of uh, use these uh, like understandings of like input output problem and like maybe like how contrived um, your, your problem is to sort of gauge the uh, how sort of good or high quality like exponential speedups in quant in, in uh, machine quantum machine learning are, um, and um, so this is just like subjective, um, but uh, yeah. So, but um, so so there's some like um, varying levels of like how 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 likely it is to be an actual exponential speedup, and so I guess using this note using this uh, color scheme. Like factoring would be in yellow. I don't even know if you can see this. Like, uh, but here, here, here's factoring. Uh, because it's uh, a high, like a like um, because it doesn't have an input problem, it doesn't have an output problem, and also we strongly believe that the speed up is is real. Um, although we 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 cannot prove it. Um, and so this is sort of the state the state of the the field like five years ago. And then there is there's a, like a series of works um, that I sort of helped with. And or I guess, yeah, um, that that uh, started with the recommendation systems algorithm and then it sort of spread to a bunch of other uh, algorithms and sort of um, showed that these there's like very strong evidence that these don't have exponential speed up. Sometimes like it's actually there is no exponential speed up. Um, other cases, it's uh, if you um, 
if you sort of consider the classical analog a reasonable classical analog, there is no speed up. Um, and sort of the question is, 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 is why this is the case um, for, for some of these and not others. And there is a pretty clear conclusion, um, which is that if you look at these, um, these all sort of rely on the QRAM based block encoding. And all of these that haven't been uh, that have that haven't been, I guess, um, that there haven't been quantum inspired algorithms for are all uh, sparsity based um, block encodings. Um, so I guess it was only like technically only last year that uh, um, I guess this sort of framing of this um, this line of work has was was uh, introduced, um, but um, sort of uh, uh, myself and my other co-authors we noticed that you can actually construct sort of a classical analog to this uh, QSVT framework, and so there's this notion of like sampling and query access, and this uh, sort of behaves as a block encoding in a, in a, in a lot of interesting ways. Um, you have sampling and query access in the same settings where you have block encodings. Um, the same sort of composition properties hold. And if you have sampling and query access to output, you can recover the same type of information as you could if you had like a block encoding. Um, and so it sort of captures the capabilities of, in particular, QRAM-based QSVT for reasons I'll explain later. And uh, because you can always find this analog for the classical case, and you can do all of the sort of compositions or whatever you need to do in polynomial time, um, or I guess time logarithmic in the input size, uh, this sort of, but as like a consequence, um, you can, this is like strong evidence that uh, using QRAM based QSVT doesn't give you exponential speed ups for like these linear algebraic tasks. Um, I guess this is not like a rigorous proof. Like um, we, we um, uh, I, this, this, this paper does not actually prove such a statement. Um, I guess you would need to like do some sort of structural induction if you wanted to I'll actually say this rigorously, but. Um, right, so um, so as an example for like the sort of quality of the algorithms that you get, they're 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 not good in terms of the polynomials. So so uh, earlier I introduced this like matrix inversion problem. Um, I said before that A was sparse, but here uh, I'm assuming that it's in QRAM, and there then uh, the S swaps out for for being sum of A, and then you get basically this. Um, uh, or sorry, this are, these should be swapped. What? That's not right. Anyways, so this is the quantum, and this is the classical. Uh, so, um, I guess one thing to note is that the, the classical is polynomially; it's only polynomially slower than the than the than the quantum. So, like, these quantities match up. And then this you tr you think of as like a pair, and so this is uh, this to this this to the twenty eight is an upper bound on this, and this to the eight is an upper or this this to the twelve is an upper bound on this. Um, the epsilon factor um, is exponentially larger, but this is uh, this is something that you can't notice. Because if you had your output state, your output um, quantum state, and you wanted to try to distinguish, um, sorry, anything that you need, you want to need need the quantum state for, you uh, would need it to like sample. Uh, what am I saying? Um, basically, you can only access this uh, this information prob probabilistically. So anything you'd want to use the state for. 
um, would be some sort of like expectation. And so you need to pay an one over epsilon squared anyways at the end of the at the end of everything. And so you actually wouldn't notice the epsilon. Um, um, or it would you would only pay like sort of like polynomial in the number of times that you um, ran the algorithm. So um, there's no there's no exponential speed up there. And, and, I'm sorry, Ian. Uh, so uh, I thought epsilon was um, was your error after measurement. So what what is epsilon in the quantum case? So epsilon. So what I output. So I'm so I'm treating epsilon as. Um, so what I'm saying, I guess, is that the output is some, is some I from some distribution mm -hmm. and the TV distance of the distribution and uh, the desired one is bounded by epsilon. Mm -hmm. Um, and I see. Yeah, I see. Okay, okay. Uh, I see. So, so you could you could be producing samples from the ideal distribution, and yet to to you you will have a sampling error after this. So, so this was before the sampling that you did. Mm -hmm. I, I got it. Okay. So, I just wanted uh, to give an example to show you that it's real. And now I'm going to move on. Um, any other questions? OK, so um, just to restate what I said, right? the idea for the QSVT is we had block encodings. And then we get some composition of sums, products, and transformations by low degree polynomials. And then we apply to a vector. Um, for the quantum inspired version, we have sampling query access to our input, and then we also do some composition of sums, products, and transformation. Uh, instead, uh, this time by like smooth functions, we don't need to actually go through this pol polynomial approximation step. And then we apply um, to, to a vector to get the desired outcome. OK. And so I haven't defined the sample query axis yet. So I'm going to, find, to define it here. Um, so pay attention to this part for a moment. So. For a vector, a length n vector, we, we say we have sample and query access to it. If we can query entries of it, we can sample according to, basically, this is like measuring um, cat phi. So we can produce samples that are like proportional to magnitude squared. Um, and then we can also know it's a Euclidean norm. Um, and we can do all this time in like polylog in, in the input size. And um, we say we have sample and query access to a matrix if we have sample and query access to its rows. And we al also have sample and query access to um, uh, the vector of row norms. So if you think about it, the vector of row norms, the norm of that is the Frobenius number of A. So, um, but so, for example, you can sample corresponding. To, you can basically measure corresponding to the rows, and you can also measure corresponding to the the row norms. And so, the 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 thing that you should be thinking about here as an instantiation of this is um, this QRAM data structure that we mentioned earlier. All right. So again, we're looking at a two by four matrix, and our data structure is just going to be like a binary series tree, and then we have weights on the nodes corresponding to the entries. And uh, you can see that we, we have all we have access to all of the, um, or I guess, all of the entries. And we also have access to um, the norms. And we can sample just by starting from like a root node and then recursing, like recur recursing to uh, a child proportional to the weights on the child. Um, so this is like a simple uh, data structure. You don't have to do it this way. You could do it with um, some other sampling data structure. It doesn't really matter. 
Um, yes. Okay. So. Uh, so uh, you uh, quickly, uh, how are you doing on time? Uh, where, where are you? Um, I I'm I can be done pretty soon. I think it. I think it. I think I'll. Uh, I'll be okay. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to actually cover any specific details of, of this. Um, so yeah, uh, or I don't need to. Okay. So, so this is what you should be thinking about, but, um, remember sampling and query access is going to be something that we compose together. So for most of the things that we, like for a lot of the things that you look at, you're not actually looking at a data structure. You're looking at like an implicit data structure. Um, okay. And now the similar notion, we, we need to extend this notion in order for it to, um, to, to compose. Um, so we say, uh, so we, we add this parameter that's going to be bounded by the vector squared. And we say we have sample and query access with, with respect to this phi. If we have sample and query access to a vector v tilde, <clears throat> and v tilde sort of uh, is an upper bound only. <clears throat> uh, and here we're, we're taking the, um, the norm of uh, v tilde squared to be equal to phi. Um, and then we, we need to have sample and query access to this v tilde, but we also need to know, know the values of the entries of phi. And you can denote, you can uh, use the same, extend the same thing to matrices. Uh, we add this parameter, the, this parameter phi. And then we say we have sample and query access with respect to this parameter if we know Sampling, we, if we know we have sampling query access to a tilde, that's an upper bound and whose Frobenius norm is equal to phi or phi, whatever. And we also need to be able to query the entries of a. Um, so um, this is the, there's a basic fact uh, that you can observe from this is that sampling query access to phi, even though you only have sampling query access to v tilde, you can actually get a, a version of sampling query access for V itself. Um, this just follows from rejection sampling, um, which I guess is a version of like post-selecting, if you want to think about it like that, um, where you sample from V tilde and then reject it with the appropriate probability. And because you have this bound here, you're able to do it in such a way that um, you don't require that many queries. And see this parameter coming back again, this uh, um, uh, before it was alpha over the norm of v squared. Here it's here it's v. Um, okay, and so here are the um, composition properties. Um, there's more of them because uh, this notion is it also has vectors involved. Um, I guess I guess technically it doesn't need to need to be this long, but um, so. If you have sampling query access to the to a bunch of vectors, you have sampling query access to their linear combination. Same with uh, matrices. Um, if you have sampling query access to vectors, you have uh, access to their outer product. And here, the uh, the amount that you pay is is uh, pretty similar to the amount that you pay in the block encoding case. Um, there's a difference here because this is. Um, like here you want an upper bound for um, sort of, okay. Here, what this is an upper bound for is um, it's an upper bound for lambda i squared times the norm of v i squared, which is an upper bound on the norm of the sum of lambda i v i squared, just by Cauchy Schwartz. So this is how like the lower bound sort of works out. Or sorry, the the bound for phi. Um, and you can find a v tilde that works and gives you this norm that you can sample from. Given um, you can sample from all of the v i's. Um, yeah, so so these are these are straightforward, and I won't show them because it's uh, it's a little annoying to to show all of the all of the things, uh, all of the things that you need for sampling query access. But um, so we started to deviate a little bit from the block encoding model if when we look at these uh, last two. So if we have sampling query access to a one and a two, 
we have a sample inquiry x goes to some m, where m is an approximation of a1 dagger a2. Um, and here we have some additive error, um, which is bad. Um, but it's actually not that bad in the context of, it, it's bad in the context of um, randomized numerical linear algebra. It's actually not that much of a concern if we want to just compare to a quantum linear algebra algorithm. Um, because, um, um, because if we're assuming that these are QRAM, then these are, these are actually going to be in play from the start. Um, you're going to need to pay something like this, at least um, up to polynomial slowdown. Um, and similarly, if we have sampling query access to A, we have sampling query access to M, where M is a, a smooth function of A, or approximately. Uh, this is the right scaling you would need uh, to, uh, this is the right scaling you need to approximate F of A. Um, okay, so kind of running out of time, so I'll speed up a little bit. So as I mentioned before, there, the main differences are like, there's like these additive errors. Um, I didn't show it, but there are large polynomial slowdowns um, like in this last step, which uh, is really the only one that you need to use. Um, but these other ones are, are, are not so important. Um, and finally, notice that our phi was an upper bound on the Frobenius norm of our matrices rather than the spectral norm. And so for example, if we had, uh, even if we had like the optimal sampling query access um, to A and B, we, when we compose, when we uh, multiply them together, we get a sample and query access with this kind of value of phi. And then using llama, we would need to pay this amount to get a measurement. Um, whereas before, if we had an optimal block encoding, this would only be a spectral norm. Um, now, here in the block encoding case, this is an alpha. And if we are working in QRAM, then this alpha is actually the Fibonacci norm squared. Um, so that's actually why um, uh, this this works as an analogy in only in the case where it's like a block it's like a it, it, you take your block encodings from QRAM. Um, it also works for the density um, operator case. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over this. Um, you can I have like a stock talk online. You can you can look at it if you want to see more details. Um, but just a couple of uh, uh, the statements about like where the directions are um, that I think are interesting. Um, so one thing is just getting these polynomials down. Um, this would basically, <clears throat> like if you could show that the QRAM based QSVT only gave like quadratic um, uh, speed ups, then that would be really, I think uh, really, really cool. Um, <clears throat> and right now the work here has, has been focused on on the case of um, uh, just regression. Because in these cases, um, there's like a whole optimization literature. You can run like SGD, where you use the measurements that you assumed um, to sort of inform your SGD and allow you to perform better. Um, <clears throat> and so, so it makes sense to use like an optimization approach here. Um, and another way to get this might be just to make this, this correspondence cleaner. I think there might be ways to um, get, get a cleaner correspondence and also improve complexity there. Um, and there's also questions of what's left for, for speed ups. Um, so these are, these might not necessarily be what I think are like the most viable quantum machine learning algorithms, but they're certainly <clears throat> ones that have, um, large claims, um, that are remaining for super polynomial speed up. So, <clears throat> So one, one thing that's uh, been interesting, there's been some study of is, is this quantum topolo topological data analysis algorithm from, uh, yeah, Lloyd Garner, Garner Roney and Zanardi, I think, I don't know. Um, and there's been some work trying to analyze whether this performs well. Um, it seems like maybe um, the algorithm that it shows is a little bit unusual and, and, and it approximates Betty numbers, but in sort of a strange way that um, 
makes it not clear whether it would actually perform well in practice um, for practical data sets. Um, <clears throat> and there's these other two examples. I actually think they might be somewhat similar. I'm not really sure. Or actually, maybe, maybe not. Um, so there's this Gaussian process regression result. Um, <clears throat> this one is nice because it actually doesn't use QRAM as far as I, I mean, it uses a version of QRAM, but not um, the data structure version of QRAM. Um, but it, I think it uses some heuristics to argue that, um, for example, you can sparsify your input matrix and, and, and then apply um, inversion. And uh, one thing, uh, there was like a new paper recently. Um, this is in like, uh, I think the last in Europe um, about this interesting problem of um, learning optimized random features. Um, and the paper is somewhat dense. So I would be curious to learn more about it or like have a, uh, an, uh, uh, a cleaner idea of what's going on there. Because they actually do compare, um, they actually do look at a problem that's believed to be intractable and um, like heavily analyzed in, in the machine learning community of like learning these random features. So if you, so some for some for some purposes you want to like uh, select features that, that 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 will perform the best for you, and that uh, and to get the best ones is actually intractable. So people just use like okay ones, um, but you can actually get the best ones if you um, are able to do like QFTs and things like this. Um, but yeah, so so these are interesting. I would I would like to see. Uh, more scrutiny towards like um, these algorithms, see if see if see uh, what they're about. But um, anyways, that's it. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you, uh, Yun, for a great talk. Uh, let's see. Shall we shall we just take a few minutes to see if there are any questions specific to the talk, and then we'll save the general questions for later because we have a panel following up on this. So. Um, if anyone has a question that's specific to to the to the talk, not the larger implications for quantum machine learning, maybe. Okay, and uh, in, in the in the meantime, I, I guess uh, even if you if you would uh, stop the screen share, then. Omid can set up the panel, you know, get uh, the panelists pinned up and, and also the speaker.